Happy Thursday, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Excited that you're here, excited to be with you, and uh, excited for you to meet our guest. Afternoon to you, Jackson. Uh, Wesley, good to see you. Emily, good to see everybody. Um, again, we always put on 92.3 The Fox in El Paso. This is who they had on today. Um, great, great bands. Um, great music for a Thursday. Sorry, just um, dealing with some folks who, who probably should not be on the stream right now. Um, but I think we got them covered. Okay, um, I'm going to keep the intro super short today because we have perhaps one of the most exciting and inspiring guests that we could have ever have hoped to have had on the show. Um, and that's including Jose Andres, who we just had uh, earlier this week, who gave us a masterclass, not just in food and food policy in the United States, but just how we could turn this moment of national tragedy that has been so terrifying for so many, so many lives lost, so many families hurting and suffering right now, and somehow come through this and find out how we can better our lives, better ourselves, and better this country. Um, I feel like President Michael Sorrell, president of Paul Quinn College, is going to inspire us along those same lines. How, how do we do our best to take care of one another, take care of those around us, uh, help this country come through this, but emerge on the other side, a better people and a better country? So very much looking forward to hearing from him quickly on the numbers and we get these every day from Elizabeth and I want to thank Elizabeth who checks in with the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control and gets the uh, Texas data from the Texas Department of Health. Globally, uh, almost 2.7 million cases, almost 190,000 of our fellow human beings on planet Earth have lost their lives to COVID-19. In the United States, 856,000 cases, over 47,000 deaths and still uh, only a little bit more than a percent of the 327 million people in this country have been tested in Texas. 22,000 cases, 574 of our fellow Texans have lost their lives and only 225,000 tests. We are the least tested state in the United States right now and it has very grave consequences and those consequences are not borne out equally in this state or in this country. We know that the working poor, we know that African-Americans, we know that Latinos are disproportionately more likely to contract coronavirus and to die of COVID-19. And so again, the three things that we keep asking about every single show, where are the tests? Where is the personal protective equipment or the PPE? And where are the ventilators for those states and hospitals that need to do everything they can to keep those alive who are having a hard time breathing on their own. Last thing that I uh, tell you about before we bring on our guest, um, and that's the work that we're doing with Powered by People. And I'm going to pin this link here right now. Um, here you go. The link's right here. Powered by People is essentially just a bunch of really good people from all over Texas and all over the country who are helping us to feed our fellow Americans, our fellow human beings at a time of record unemployment, more people in Texas have filed for unemployment in the last four weeks than did in all of 2019. Folks are having a very hard time taking care of themselves, making ends meet, feeding themselves and their families, and they need our help. And so if you are food secure, if you don't have any underlying conditions, if you have the time, um, I need you to sign up for a shift at your closest Texas food bank. And you can do that right here uh, on the link that's pinned below, poweredbypeople.org. Um, we will put you to work. There's 21 food banks that serve every one of the 254 counties in Texas, and they need the help right now. And I wanna make sure that we all step up while we have the chance to do something for our fellow Texans or our fellow Americans right now. You can also, if you can't uh, donate time in person, you can donate money that we split evenly between the 21 food banks in Texas. Again, you can go to that link uh, at poweredbypeople.org. Lastly, if you would like to ask a question of one of the most amazing people in this country today, uh, Michael Sorrell, um, I'm going to read you his accolades in just a second. Um, this is the uh, button right here. You push that button into your question. If it's germane to the conversation, I will ask it of President Sorrell. So 
Um, when I think about the, the through line of this show that we have been transmitting and receiving your comments on every weekday for the last four weeks or so, essentially, these are my heroes. These are the folks who inspire me, who are making a difference in the world, and who I think we should all be listening to and following. From Jacqueline Westman, who started Project PPE, to take displaced garment workers in L.A., pay them to fabricate the PPE that the government isn't able to supply and sending that off to hospitals and to farm workers and to food banks all over this country. Shannon Watts, who is a national leader on gun violence and introducing gun sense legislation. Jose Andres, who I just mentioned a little while ago. Cleavon Gilman, a New York City emergency room doctor who's on the front lines living this day in and day out. Um, I put Michael Sorrell in, in this category of people who are doing extraordinarily important work and are super inspiring to me personally. He is the longest serving president of Paul Quinn College in its 147 year history. He has made it America's first urban work college. We'll hear a little bit from him about just what that means. Um, and then here are some of his accolades. I asked Cynthia to give me a little bit of his bio and she sent me like eight pages of stuff that has been written about him. But, but here's just the cliff notes. Uh, named one of the world's 50 greatest leaders by Fortune Magazine is the only three-time recipient of the historically black college universities male president of the year award time magazine listed him as one of the 31 people changing the south uh, washington magazine uh, identified him as one of america's 10 most innovative college presidents and in addition he was named uh, a member of the route 100 a list of the top 100 emerging leaders in america by root online magazine. Um, beyond all that, he's been a really good friend to me and someone who has just, again, been personally inspiring. So I hope that you will give a warm welcome to Michael Sorrell, as long as I can find him in our in our viewers. Um, shoot, with that, with that big wind-up, Kano, I'm not seeing him in here. Um, don't make me bring on Lisa D again. Um, Connor, do you want to send him a text to make sure that, that he's on <laughs> after all that? Let's see if we can find him again. You know, if he makes a comment, Connor, here he is. God, that was a user error on my part. I think he'd requested and I just hadn't seen him. President Sorrell. How are you, my friend? You, you are in motion. I, I am in motion. I uh, I had a plan that would have gotten me back home after I picked up a bicycle. Uh, that plan did not quite work out. So I am here uh, in my car, but excited to be here nonetheless. Um, let me let me ask the the first and most important question: How are you, and how is your family? Oh, uh, everyone is well. Thank you for asking. How's Amy and the family? They're good. Uh, we are, I don't know if you know this, but Amy started the O'Rourke Homeschool for the Gifted. And uh, we are running classes daily, um, starting with PE at 8 a.m. every morning. And it finishes up around 3 or 3.30, at which point uh, I oversee Ulysses and Henry's basketball practice for, for about a half hour. And then they're welcome to go shoot on their own. So we're all doing really well. Uh, we're really concerned, of course, about those who are not a lot of people um, scared right now, a lot of people losing loved ones and not able to be with them in their final moments. A lot of people having a hard time feeding themselves. And one of the most moving stories I've read recently was about Paul Quinn College, the institution that you lead. They interviewed some of your graduating seniors who have overcome so much and in so many instances are the first in their families to go to college despite some incredible odds and just on the eve of their ability to walk at graduation, they found that they've been unable to do that. Can you talk a little bit about how you have met that challenge and how you've worked with these students on a personal basis or on a class basis? Sure, you know, I mean, first of all, you were there last year as our commencement speaker, so you got to see the magic firsthand. And I always tell people, if you can come to our commencement and not be moved, by just the energy in the place, by the excitement and the love of these families and recognizing what it means for these students to graduate, um, then 
then you really have lost touch with humanity, right? Agreed. Um, but the what's really, you know, the, the virus is impacting so many parts of our world and our community. But with our students, and, and I didn't, you know, let me be very clear. I knew it would hurt them, but I don't think I appreciated the depth at which it would hurt not having that moment, right? I mean, because they're still graduating. They still met the requirements. I mean, in the big scheme of things, you know, you, you miss the ceremony. But the ceremony is important, and having people see you in that moment. And so one of the things that we're doing that, uh, you know, we'll formally announce um, early next week is, I got together with 75, 74, 75 of the other historically black colleges and created the National HBCU Commencement Ceremony uh, Celebration, right? And so, you know, May 16th, we're going to give all of our seniors an opportunity to be recognized and seen. You know, we're going to live stream it. And it, it's just a way of saying we see you, we understand, we love you. We can't make up for that moment of going across the stage, but we can let you know that America loves you and that people recognize you. So it's, it's a small thing, but it's a, it's just a big, big moment that we want to celebrate. I love that you found a way to overcome this and it's not perfect. It's not the ideal graduation for a lot of people, but it is the best of a really bad situation. And one of the comments that I read in the article about this from you was, Look, you, you may not have the chance to walk and attend in person, in, in you know, live, the, the commencement ceremony, but the fact that you graduated and you now have this degree and you can go on and do things in your life that otherwise you would not have been able to do, that should not be lost on you. That's, that's the big picture, and that's a thing for us to, to remember. I've got to ask you about this, and I know you, you get asked about this too much, perhaps in other contexts. But um, I was talking to uh, Chef Jose Andres uh, recently, and you may know uh, from his organization, World Central Kitchen, when you have earthquakes in Puerto Rico, he's there feeding people. Um, he just opened National Stadium in Washington, D.C. to feed the people of our nation's capital in the midst of COVID-19. And he's talked about how we might, we might want to think about repurposing or reusing uh, schools and restaurants in our communities to serve food out to the larger population. Tell the people who are watching who don't know the story about the football stadium at Paul Quinn College and how you're helping to meet some of the needs in, in what before then was kind of a food desert in North Texas. Sure, so when I arrived at Paul Quinn, the area surrounding that neighborhood, that school, that neighborhood was a food desert. We were closer to the city's garbage dump than we were a grocery store, which is, is just ridiculous, right? Like if anyone in America can actually say they're closer to a garbage dump than a grocery store, it is a failing of historic proportions. And we, um, you know, I, I naively thought, oh, how hard can it be to, you know, get a grocery store? I mean, there's none here. It's a monopoly. You'll have all the customers you can want. Surely this is going to be easy. I was blown away. It took over two years of offering people free land, um, every sweetheart deal that I could think of. And it wasn't until one of the grocers said, the people in your neighborhood don't look like our customers. Wow. That we fully appreciated. It wasn't, it wasn't the math. It wasn't the economics. I mean, people hide behind that. It was the bias. It was the prejudice. It was the fact that, you know, poor black and brown people, somehow their money wasn't as green as everyone else's. And so we, um, we had terminated the football program when I got to Paul Quinn because we just couldn't afford it. And we, you know, sat there, and I was at a lunch one day with one of our donors and just was going into my spiel about how horrible this was. And he said, well, do you have anywhere if I gave you money for a community garden to put a garden? I said, yeah, we can put it on the football field. And he said, well, can you do that? I was like, yeah, I'm the president. We can do whatever we want to do, right? Like, I'm just being kind of funny. And next thing you know, he gives us the money to put a community garden in. Then he tells the folks from Pepsi, from, um, Pepsi that 
that um, that they were um, what we were doing, and they came out to visit. And so I said, hey, we should turn the whole football field into a farm. And, again, they were sort of like, well, do you have any agriculture programs? You know, and I was sort of like, we didn't. So I was like, no. I was like, do you think we need any? You know, and they kind of laughed, like, it might be handy. And um, just convinced them that we could do this thing. And we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, We just were filled with righteous rage. And, you know, the Lord smiled on us, you know, and – we we were too we were too stupid to know that it should have never worked, and it worked. And to this day, we've grown over fifty thousand pounds of food. We wow. give away over ten percent of everything that we grow. We have this wonderful, wonderful farm director, um, Kim, who's just her story itself is compelling and beautiful. Our students run the farm. Um, it, it's just it's just it's the right thing to do. And we're just honored to be able to do it. Before I ask you my next question, I got to tell you, there is a ton of love coming through. You, you aren't able to read all the comments coming through. But one from Courtney Craig, she says, thanks for always pushing us, Prez, to dream bigger. I love that. What, what a great compliment to you and, and your leadership. So perhaps on this same theme, um, I follow you on Twitter. And I saw that you retweeted something from Dr. Kendi the other day talking about the decision on behalf of of Georgia by their governor to basically reopen the state. And wittingly or not, uh, that decision is going to impact some people more than it is others. Can can you talk a little bit about that and beyond Georgia, what this means for the country? Sure. Well, I mean, the first thing, you know, let's be clear. The absence of leadership that is being shown by some of our supposed leaders is staggering. Right. I mean, look, I, I have a master's in public policy. I understand the public policy implications of people not having jobs and working and all of that. I get that. Right. But your first responsibility is to the care and safety of your constituents. Right. And that means you don't put them in harm's way. You don't make fun of the science. I mean, if you don't understand the science, that's one thing. Right. Go get someone to explain it to you. Right. But this science isn't that hard. Okay, this is a virus that is easy to catch. It is spread by human contact and close proximity. We have no widespread testing, which, by the way, is unimaginable in the United States. Okay, I have no idea how it is that we have not yet retooled the factories to be able to produce the test that we need. But that's a different like I won't go down that path. Right. But we have no widespread testing. We have no vaccine. So basically we're going to open things back up, send people back to the beaches, send people back. I mean, did you see the, the mayor of Las Vegas is going to open up the casinos? I mean, so you're just sending people like lambs to the slaughter. Because they are- and, and let's be clear about who, who they're asking to, to go in. So when they asked the mayor of Las Vegas, would you go to the casino? She hesitated and said, well, I have a family. And essentially saying those who who have to work. And I saw a a really great um, tweet the other day where someone said, let's let's stop elevating the hourly wage workers who have to go into work right now and and stop calling them heroes and stop calling them courageous, because really many of them have no choice. If they're going to put food on the table, they got to go into that Walgreens. They got to go into that casino if it opens. They know because they understand the public health that this is a danger to them and their families, but their local government or their national government has given them no choice. And when we see black and brown Americans dying disproportionately more than white Americans, when we know it's gonna be the lower income worker stock in the shelves or ringing the cash register, or in Georgia where they're opening up beauty salons and gyms and, and tattoo parlors, those are the folks who are going to become sick and bring that virus back to their families. So again, I I never want to ascribe motive. And so unwittingly or not, um, that decision, decisions like those are going to hurt people. I don't know if you saw our Lieutenant Governor saying there are more important things than living. And it it, it begs the question, well, then who are you asking to die in Texas if you reopen this state right now? Um, It, it, It is, I mean, it is staggering the carelessness and the lack of regard that people are showing for all of us, right? I mean, let's just let's just throw out that we're all supposed to 
have, or maybe not all, sorry, but we're in Texas and everyone, you know, claims some kind of religious bent, right? So I don't know a single religion that says you should be cruel. I don't know a single religion that says you should disregard the poor. I, I don't know, I don't understand that, right? I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to agree with everything, but I do believe this. You should not lead people that you cannot love. Mm. Right, like you can't love them if you can't make the sacrifices necessary to care for them, then you should not be in those positions. And when you hear things such as being cavalier, like well, you know, everyone you know doesn't need to live, right? Well, are you prepared to die, right? Because what's happening? I have friends who have had their parents die because of this disease, mm. right? Who one of my good friends in Chicago. Her mother just died. Her stepfather has it. Hmm. Her father has it. And her stepmother has it. The irony or the, the ridiculousness of all this, none of them have been able to get a test. She continuously takes them to the, to the doctor. They go to hospital after hospital. But because they are, and, and they're not poor black people, but they are not wealthy. So they have to depend on community health care, and the community health care isn't testing them. So whatever our numbers are, they're false numbers, okay, because we're not administering enough tests to know who actually is sick. And we're hiding behind this whole notion of preexisting health conditions as if that is the reason to blame people right. for being adversely impacted by this, right? Blaming I mean, the people who got sick. Blaming the people who got sick. It's just, it's absurd, it is cruel, um, and, you know, we have to be better. And I just firmly believe that we're entering a point in this country where the carelessness, the callousness of the leaders is being exposed in a way that people can no longer ignore it, right? And, you know, it's just time, enough, enough of poor leadership, right? Just I've got... President Sir, I've got our first question from a, a viewer. I know we have about seven minutes left. This is from Skylar. What's your advice to students who are struggling with mental health challenges during this pandemic? Yeah, so the first thing that I would tell a student who's struggling with mental health um, issues is to recognize you are not alone. The, the majority of us in some way, shape or form are suffering mental health um, damage from this experience right, from watching our friends die and not being able to mourn them, from living with the fear that you can't even hug people you care about mm. without worrying about dying, right? So one of the things that is important to understand in any, I think, in any mental health situation, number one is that you are not alone. You are not in this by yourself. And find people who you can talk to honestly and earnestly and say, I'm scared, right? And look, and I will tell you, I'm scared, right? Like, I'm scared. Like, I, I don't like where we are. And the, what you, if you have the ability to find someone who can help you get the help that you need, the support you need, um, if you cannot do that, you know, if you want to get in contact with me, I'll put you in contact with our mental health providers at our college, and they can refer you to someone that can get you the support that you need because no one – this is what we believe at Paul Quinn. All of our students, you come to Paul Quinn, you get a mental health evaluation just as part of your entrance process, right? Not because we want to isolate you, but because we want to support you, right? We, because the thing about this is everyone goes through a difficult season, everyone. There is no one that hasn't been through a difficult season, but it doesn't have to be the rest of your life. And we want to get you the support you need so that it's just a season, not a lifetime. This is from Ryan O'Malley. Uh, Ryan asks, and this, this is probably advice that you're dispensing to your graduating seniors, but given the implosion of the economy, and not only are we certainly uh, in recession territory, some fear that we may see a contraction that will produce something far more devastating than the Great Depression of, of the 1930s, what are you telling your seniors and, and what advice do you have for, for Ryan, who's a graduating senior, who's going to be trying to get a job in, in this new economy? And, and one, one thing uh, that I read in one of the articles about Paul Quinn recently 
uh, this has imperiled the urban work college model, the, the placements and the internships that you have pioneered. How are you helping these seniors get ready for whatever comes next? Yeah, so I was a senior in the 1988 when the market crashed during the 1987 stock market crash. In fact, I had an internship where I was sitting at the desk of one of the investment banking firms watching the market crash. Mm. So my solution was I went to graduate school, right? I'm not being cavalier, but, you know, that's typically in cycles what a lot of people do. They go to school and try and wait out the cycle. But if you don't have the ability to do that, um, there are people who are hiring now. The key is to find those industries that are doing so. It may require you to do something different than what you had your heart set. I'm going to give you the advice that I literally just gave one of my seniors this morning. And I said, at the early part of your career, it is less about where you work, and it is more about whether you're working in a place where people love you mm. and are investing in you, right? So my first 10 or 12 years of being a professional, I worked in things, I worked at jobs where I, I didn't necessarily – have an interest in the subject matter as much as I had an interest in the people and I had an interest in learning. I think you learn as much as you can about as much as you can, and then you keep moving. And my advice to you is be open to the possibility that your best opportunity would come in a place that you hadn't thought about. Embrace that opportunity, learn as much as you can and count that as a blessing because when things turn around, and this is important also for folks to understand, things are going to get better, right? Like they'll turn around. They're not going to turn around today. They're not going to turn around tomorrow. But we will get through this. We'll get to the other side. We'll be better than we've ever been because we'll be wiser for the experience. Mm. In church, they tell you, you don't get a testimony without a test. <laughs> right? This is our test. This is our uh, test. This is our test. So I just I wish those seniors the best of luck. And I hope they'll be open to opportunities and places that just might not have been where they first thought they'd go. My last question for you, and this, this is a, a big one and a big picture question. Uh, what do you hope for? Um, what will you work towards seeing for America as we come through this? You just said, you know, one way or another, we're going to come through this. And at one point, this will be behind us. And we'll be able to testify about the test that, that we experienced how would you like to see America change? How would you like America to be better on the other side of this? After uh, I read that someone called this uh, great pandemic, the great revealer, it's, it's laying bare uh, so many of the divisions and disparities that we have in this country. Seeing this for many people for the first time, um, others having lived it their entire life, what, what do you hope changes on the other side of this? I, I think that the time has come now for those of us who truly love the people in this country, right? Because it, everybody claims to love America, but I think some people's vision of America, version of America, is a selfish vision and is a selfish version. And I think you have to love the people more than you love the institutions, right? And so I think those of us who actually love the people, that love Americans, I think we're going to have to do more. I think we're going to have to accept that whatever it is that we've been doing, and I'm not saying that we haven't been doing a lot and that others haven't been doing a lot. What I am saying is that I think the time has come for us to realize that whatever it is that we have been doing that has moved the needle as far as we've moved it, we're going to have to double down and move the needle more. And I just, because that's the only way this is going to get better. We have seen what it looks like when the other folks have control of the agendas because this isn't, this isn't a Republican or Democratic crisis, right? This is a crisis of leadership. This is a crisis of common sense. This is a crisis of um, just respecting, respecting people, right? I mean, no, no Democrat has a monopoly on no Republican does. But the absence of leadership, the failure of leadership, the failure of respecting the bad that can happen to people, is what got us here. And those of us with respect for those things are now going to have to step in and just do more. And I'm counting myself as a part of that. I mean, it, it's just it's time for all of us to dig in a little bit deeper 
and come a little harder because this, like, we've seen what happens when we don't. And I don't ever want to be in this place again. I don't ever want to hear my daughter going around the house hoping that the virus doesn't get us and that it gets over soon. I, I, my son, every day, you know, I'm watching him and trying to manage his mental health because he's nine, right? His school year's over. He can't see his friends. He can't do the things that he loves to do. Um, not, I mean, he can hang out with us, right? He loves to do that. But, you know, I don't want this for them. I don't want this for anyone's children, and I don't want this for our country. There, there's an amazing picture, and I encourage everyone to, to look it up and find it. And it's a President Sorrell with his son playing basketball on the court, at, on the outdoor court at Paul Quinn College, an empty Paul Quinn College. And it's a poignant moment, and, and it's profound because the student body is not there anymore, but it's you and your son together. And I just, I just found it to be really powerful. Well, I, I don't know if you heard this at, at the outset, but I, I count you amongst the, the most inspiring people I have ever met, bar none personally inspiring to me and offering me guidance and, and wisdom along the way. And then I have seen the effect that you've had on the Quinite Nation. Um, you talked about how moving the graduation ceremony is. P people are moved in large part because of you and what you have meant personally to them in their lives. And Paul Quinn is so lucky to have you, but I've got to just, I've just got to lay this out there and you don't need to respond to it. But uh, Dwight Eisenhower was the, the president of my alma mater, uh, Columbia. I believe Woodrow Wilson was the president of, of Princeton. Both of them from that position um, led the country as president of the United States. I sincerely hope that, that that is part of your trajectory going forward. You are just one of the most amazing leaders I've ever met or listened to. And it's not just the rhetoric, it's not just the talk, it's the, the transformation that you have produced, um, not just at Paul Quinn, but I think maybe most importantly there, but really in every aspect of your life, every community, you've lived in. So I feel so lucky to know you and to count you as a friend and so grateful that you'd spend some time with our viewers so they could have a chance to meet you too. And I wish you the best through this upcoming graduation ceremony online and, and then hope that your student body is back in force in person uh, in the fall of, of 2020. Well, thank you. And please know that Natalie sends her best to you and Amy and to Cynthia and you know, we are sitting here cheering you on in everything you do. We are Team Beto, you know, for whatever comes next, for the now, the next, and all of it, because we just think that you are special and that we are a better place because we have someone like you with us. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thanks again, and be well. Best to your family. You too. You take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. So uh, President Sorrell says he's Team Beto. Little does he realize that Team Beto is on Team Sorrell. So uh, I, I want him uh, in the highest position of public trust possible. That, that's somebody I want to lead us in, in whatever capacity. And uh, I know we're late in 2020, so that's probably not happening. But somewhere down the line, mark my words, um, you're going to see um, a Governor Sorrell, a, a President Sorrell, and, and President certainly in a, an important presidency right now, Paul Quinn, but I'd love to see him someday president of, of this country. He's, he's that gifted. Um, he's, he's that diligent in pursuing the common goal for all of us. And I hope you got a sense of why I'm so impressed by him. Tomorrow, um, we do have somebody in a position of public trust. You know what? I can't get this picture to load. Um, but it's, it's Eric Swalwell. He's a member of Congress uh, representing a district in the Bay Area, was elected in 2012, and has become a leader on a number of issues. Um, one important and near and dear to my heart, and that's reforming our gun laws so that we reduce the amount of gun violence in the United States. And I think more than any public leader that I know of, he took a very bold, courageous position on assault weapons long before anybody else in public life that I know of was doing that. He was talking about a mandatory buyback of military style weapons that were designed and engineered and sold to the militaries of the world for the express purpose of killing people. They weren't sold for hunting. They weren't sold for self-defense. They were sold to kill people. And when you see these assholes on the courthouse steps in almost every state now, right? These astroturf protests that were bought and paid for by right-wing extremists, toting their guns, 
dressed for battle with battle armor on with their faces obscured that shit is as close to terrorism without killing people as you can get in the united states because they're there to terrify to intimidate to try to change the political results by threatening the use of violence and eric swalwell's been one of these leaders who's talked about how destructive that is to our democracy and how it ends in the deaths of too many of our fellow Americans. So um, we're going to have Eric Swalwell on tomorrow, and I hope that you all will join us. Um, Cynthia is sending me the picture. I know Cynthia, but I can't take the picture from the text you just sent and then produce it on onto the screen. But uh, we'll figure this out. Um, you know what? I could show you my iPad. Um, check this out. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. Uh, Instagram Live with Eric Swalwell. Thank you to our graphics department, Christy, and our producer uh, in that rock wall, and Cynthia Cano. Um, and thank you all. Hope you all are well. Um, just take a break, have a cup of coffee, drink a beer, um, soak in the wisdom of President Sorrell, and we'll see you tomorrow with Eric Swalwell. Thanks, everybody.